thermoregulation or temperature control is all about, I'm not sure why my pen's not working, is all about maintaining, we need to maintain body temperature 37 degrees Celsius plus or minus one degree Celsius. So in other words, 37 is our kind of our uh, neutral base homeostatic uh, temperature and the body's thermoregulation systems will always try to maintain and return body temperature to that state okay and we give a we've got a little bit of tolerance here plus or minus one degree so 38 degrees is high but it's within tolerance 36 degrees is low but it's intolerant so just bear that one in mind now how does this happen well first of all i'm just going to put a bit of a, a secondary image in here hopefully that's going to appear for me not sure why it didn't there we go uh, <laughs> that's why there we go I said click the wrong uh, layer apologies obviously we've got a brain here and I want to introduce you folks to this little part of the brain just here and I'm going to refer to this part of your brain or one's brain as the hypothalamus okay so we've got the hypothalamus here and this hypothalamus is really, really important in terms of thermoregulation. Why? Because it receives information. So, for example, the hypothalamus receives information th from thermoreceptors. Okay, so we have got thermoreceptors that are in, for example, the blood. We have got thermoreceptors that are in, for example, the skin. Of course, the, both of these locations are capable of uh, sensing uh, increase and decrease temperature. And what these do is these receptors, they feed that information back to that hypothalamus as previously mentioned. And that hypothalamus then has the capacity to stimulate responses to that change in temperature. So let's say we have just started exercising, we're legging it down a track, we're in the gym and we're lifting some weights. We are going for a brisk walk in a beautiful countryside, let's say in Hampshire, which is where I am in the south of England right now. What's gonna happen in that situation, of course, is the body temperature is gonna increase. Likewise, if we're in very, very cold conditions, we get into cold water, for example, or we go mountain walking and it's a very, very low temperature or a brisk wind or whatever it happens, we've said brisk twice and I've never said brisk ever. But anyway, let's say that's the case. What is it that the hypothalamus can do? What can, and if we were to picture it, obviously it'd be sort of, let me change color, it would be here, wouldn't it be, it'd be somewhere kind of in there. What can this hypothalamus do? So let me give you some examples. So the first one, it is capable of vasodilating or vasoconstricting, vasoconstricting, S in there, constricting, vasodilate or vasoconstricting of arterioles. So just to be clear what we mean by this, the smaller arteries, obviously blood vessels leaving the heart, the smaller versions of these Okay, if this is our artery, within it, it, if we have sort of the opening there, we would call that the lumen, but within this, we have a layer of kind of smooth muscle like this. And when that muscle contracts or constricts, it will push inwards, squeeze inwards, and of course, what it will do is it will make this lumen ever smaller. So maybe it will go down to this sort of size, for example. If it vasodilates, this smooth muscle will relax, lessen its tone, and then this lumen will become bigger. Okay, <laughs> not quite the same scale, those are they? But you get the idea. Now, so what would happen? If we were in hot conditions, for example, we would get vasoconstriction. Let's call this C for constriction. We would get vasoconstriction going to, uh, go, sorry, going to the core of the body. So if we were in hot conditions or we were getting particularly hot, we would get vasoconstriction going to the core of the body, the internal part of the body. Why? Because that is sort of like deep tissue. It's hot in there, it's warm, and then the blood will remain warm. Whereas if we were to dilate the uh, arterioles leading to the skin, then what's going to happen? The blood is going to pass by the skin in greater quantities, and as a result of that, it's going to re it's going to experience a cooling effect. So you might notice, for example, that when one exercises, the skin becomes redder. Why? Because we get vasodilation of blood going 
towards the skin becomes redder in essence. Now, of course, in cold conditions, the opposite might happen, right? The blood will be pushed to the core of the body and away from the skin. Why? Because it wants to be held deeper to maintain that temperature, to maintain 37 plus or minus one degree. So we have vasodilation constriction, but that, this hypothalamus, it also doesn't just sort of have a kind of a muscular control. If I sort of bring down here, it also has the capacity to stimulate sweat glands. Now, generally speaking, we're not gonna sweat any more. In fact, we'll sweat less in cold conditions. But if the conditions are hot, we are gonna get an up arrow, a greater production of sweat. Okay, no, no surprise here. You know that if you go for a jog, you're gonna sweat, generally speaking. You're gonna play tennis, you're gonna sweat, generally speaking. Why is that the case? Well, sweating is effective as a cooling mechanism because when, when sweat leaves the skin, it causes what we refer to as an evaporation effect. Well, it actually causes evaporation. And that is cooling to the skin, which then overall helps to cool the body. So sweat glands can be stimulated hormonally, of course, by um, the hypothalamus. And then we get that. Next example, we have got, just linking back here, let me choose a different color, nice yellow. We have also got, I'll just put this one up here. We also have got on the skin what are called erector pili muscles. I always want to put two eyes in the middle of this word, but there's only one. But we have erector pili muscles. Now, to be clear what these are, on the skin, I mean, they're nowhere near as big as this. On the skin, we have these tiny little hairs, tiny little hairs like this. And in cold conditions, those hairs will stand up. You've probably noticed this in your own body. I mean, they're nowhere near the scale I'm drawing them. Tiny, tiny little hairs. And what happens is those hairs will stand up in cold conditions and effectively they will capture air which will now sit as a buffer layer above the skin and will effectively act as kind of like a layer between the outside air and the air that sits on the skin, which is kind of warmed by the skin, and it actually helps us just to stay a little bit warmer. It's not particular, it's not it's not the most dramatic effect, but it's a little bit of an insulating effect as a result. So there's a erector pili. Now, what happens in hot conditions? Those erector pili muscles, um, uh, those erector pili muscles, they uh, they relax and of course those little hairs drop back downwards to sit against the skin and we don't carry as much air in that kind of layer above. And then finally folks, and I'm sure this has happened to you on many of an occasion, if I just sort of scoot all the way down here from the hypothalamus, we also have skeletal muscles. Now you will know that skeletal muscles generally are controlled by the somatic efferent system. Okay, what I mean by that is that skeletal muscles, you know, like the muscles of your shoulders, of your upper arms, of your legs, generally speaking, you will control those consciously, voluntarily, okay? Now, what we're saying here is that the hypothalamus can cause you to shiver, to move those muscles, to constrict and contract those muscles. And then, of course, what's gonna happen is my pen has stopped to work here. Uh, what's gonna happen here is, of course, that's gonna generate heat. It's gonna have that sort of thermal, uh, thermogenic effect is going to release heat and it's going to help to, uh, to warm. So for example, imagine you're starting, you're at the, it's eight o'clock in the morning in London in April, you're about to start uh, a marathon, but it's really, really cold. You might shiver, right? You've got your ma marathon running gear, you're about to leg it 26.2 miles or 40, was it 42.2 kilometers? And you're about to do all that. You're probably going to do it in less than three hours because you're an absolute machine. But as you're st stood on that start line, waiting for the crowds to move, you start to shiver because it's cold. And that sort of like trembling releases heat into the body, into the tissue and keeps us a little bit warm. That is thermoregulation. We're gonna revisit it in many, many degrees. Uh, later on in this course, we're gonna look at the impact of the environment. For now, as an introduction, that's the role of the hypothalamus in achieving thermoregulation. Cheers.